Hey there fellow fight fans, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and I am ecstatic. Of all the Muhammad Ali fights, the one versus Leon Spinks, I don't really get it. I mean, the Maha the, the, wait, the wait, Rumble wait, in the wait, Jungle wait, or the Perilla in Manila. Sphinx, Muhammad Ali, we're talking about Sphinxes. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Really? You know what we're talking about. You're right, I do. It was just a test, Jim. Because we're talking about Sphinxes. <clears throat> Got me. On WebDM. Oh, yeah. Go, 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 go. This episode is brought to you by Monty Cook Games and their upcoming 5e book, Plane Breaker, a new supplement for planar adventuring. This is a big deal. You could say that Monty and the other designers at MCG wrote the book on Planescape when they worked on D&D during 2nd and 3rd edition. Actually, they worked on a whole bunch of them. And now they're writing a new book with brand new planes, monsters, and player options as the Plane Breaker traverses the multiverse. Don't miss this one, folks. The Kickstarter begins soon. Thousands of people are already following the project. So join them here. Link in the comments and description, too. All right, Jim. It's time to, uh, to judge ourselves to see if we're yeah. worthy Man. Uh, of providing information tests. on... On the Sphinxes. Well, I shouldn't have picked the Sphinx then, because that's yeah, all that's they true. do, that's right? Our, that's on us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We chose the subject. <laughs> we got to pass the test, and then we get the treasure. Um, uh. <laughs> so, 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 Jim, uh, what, what, what draws you to Sphinx? I mean, that's what we're that's we're talking about Sphinxes today, and we're by the way, we're just covering the two that are in the Monster Manual, uh, yeah, yeah, not yeah. not the others that have been uh, released. Yeah, not the others. Yeah. Supplements. <laughs> Um, Although no so longer what, the eight types you of sphinxes it? from D and D's past, but yeah. uh, yeah. yes, yes, the octo sphinx, <laughs> right? Good, uh, I like them because they are such a head scratcher, right? Like when you look at that stat block, you go like, "Wait a minute, mm -hmm. this is kind of a what kind of monster is this? Is this is this a bruiser? Like, am I meant to just like mix it up in melee with these creatures? Like a big feline type monster suggests? Like Manticore is the king of this." kind of thing uh, for its CR. Mm -hmm. um, but you look at Sphinx and like got CR 17, CR 11. They seem weak for their CRs. Like their hit points aren't that great. They have the bare minimum of, of what I would consider appropriate resistance for like a divinely created magical creature, you know? Uh, uh -huh. And like the more I look at them and their spell selection and their abilities, it's like this is a monster that has a stat block because D&D &D monsters have stat blocks. And D and D is a yes. game about fighting monsters, so it's it's got one that's oriented towards combat. But the real power of the Sphinx as a monster lies in its campaign use, in it in this that this is an enigmatic, mysterious guardian of something uh, divinely created. You know, it, it doesn't need to eat, doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need to worry about <laughs> procreating or, or where it's going to, you know, uh, find its next meal. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to worry about that. It it just guards this thing uh at, you know with baseline uh, lore and in that sense i look at the monster and i go man there's a lot of really cool stuff here to use as a campaign monster and that means that i'm going to try to engineer uh encounters and and uh, situations with a sphinx that aren't uh like obviously combat encounters you know it's always possible mm -hmm. for the players to like draw swords and now roll an initiative that kind of thing but there's a lot I can do to set it up so that we never get to that. And this monster is sort of there as maybe a quest giver, uh, someone that they can go to for information or lore, someone that they can go to to like be tested to get some sort of reward. Um, in that sense, I really, really enjoy this monster uh, and, and try to put him in uh, every campaign that I have. At least somewhere there's one uh, lurking around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and like you said, um, w you know, while they have a big bag, they have a bag of hit points, and they have an eh, okay AC, I guess. I'm talking about the Andro Sphinx here, just for example. But when you look True. at their attacks, like they they just have the two attacks, and it's not that much damage. I mean, in the description, it yeah. says they have massive feline paws that can tear a man in <laughs> half, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, but you're just rolling two d ten plus six and CR seventeen. Yeah. So that sure, paladin's yeah. gonna have like a hundred hit points, and yeah, it's gonna take a while I mean, to claw through. Yeah, that, so. it's gonna take a while. <laughs> so, like, like you're saying, 
to to think about them beyond that and uh yeah. uh and, and and just let's 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 look at some of these abilities so we can figure out for dms like how best to use them certainly um, yeah yeah. I mean, uh, the, the the thing is, is on a baseline, the two sphinxes are very similar, um, mm. uh, with some expanded immunities for for the Andra sphinx as far as like bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non magical. That's immunity yeah. versus it's a resistance like, for the Gyna sphinx. Yeah, yeah, the government resistance. Yeah, the the Andra sphinx also has like three, all three good saves proficiency in them plus int. Mm -hmm. So it's you know it's got the uh, illusion uh, angle covered there too. So. Yeah, like, yeah. magically, they've got some good defenses. Although I would also expect to see magic resistance here. But for the most part, I think this is where you start seeing that this is not like a centerpiece monster. I could, you know, I could see using a Sphinx as, like, backup for a Celestial of some kind. Uh, you know, with an Andro Sphinx, it might be a Planetar or Solar even. Um, oh, yeah. or, or that this is a support monster for a bunch of lower CR Monsters, so like a sphinx, an Andro Sphinx or a kind of Sphinx that's like backing up a bunch of veterans or or even like guards, like really low CR kind of creatures that are benefiting from this spell casting monster that they can kind of rally around. Um, those mm -hmm. would be interesting. But like I said at the top of the show, I, I really like using the Sphinx in other capacities. And so when I look at the stat block, I'm thinking of like, what can I change with the spells? What can I do with the spells that are already listed? Um, and then I'm looking at those bizarre and, and uh, like unprecedented in the rest of 5e uh, lair actions that it has. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, especially <laughs> with the Andrew Sphinx obviously is a cleric uh, mm. and, and the, the Gyna Sphinx is an uh, arcane caster. Um, yeah, and yeah. so it's, that's one thing that I, I like, you know, we sometimes get questions on, on stuff similar to this, but it's okay to switch some spells around there. Like, it, yeah, that's it's why it says mail. that they tell you to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, just, but some people, it seems like they're like, well, but I don't like those spells. And it's like, well, it says switch they, up. the following cleric spells prepared, which means yeah. that they could probably prepare other ones, but this is just so you have something at the table. I'm just saying, I imagine an Andrew Sphinx that is tricked out like a cleric, like a PC cleric would do it with sure. sacred, with, gar you know, spirit guardians and magical, you know, spiritual weapon and oh, all yeah. that goodness. Um, <laughs> I mean, come on now. deafness but... thrown in there. Yeah, there's a mm -hmm. lot of ways that you could change up the spell loadout and it would really change a combat encounter here. And the Gyno Sphinx has a lot, has a much stronger swell, spell suite in this sense, the darkness, uh, greater invisibility. They both have Dispel mm -hmm. Magic and Banishment, which are probably the spells that I would go to uh, with them. Oh, but, yeah. you know, it, it really depends on the action economy. I might use the legendary actions for it. But, yeah, you, you can certainly change things up. And with a monster like a Sphinx, you can even just say, like, I don't know what spells they have until it's my turn. And then whatever one I need, I'll have, because these things are divinely empowered you know, geniuses, given their intellect scores or intelligence scores, like, I think that's totally appropriate. You're going to use a Sphinx in a fight maybe once in a campaign. It should be memorable. And having a good spell selection is, is part of that. Um, mm -hmm. The other part is, like, the skillful use of its layer actions. Because if you've never taken a look at the Sphinx's layer actions, it's like, They're I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's like anything else like it in 5e, right? Like, they can only use one per fight until they take a short or long rest. And they do things like, the first one's like, yeah, yeah, you can have everybody reroll initiative, which is of questionable value. But then you start aging creatures, you start transporting them through time, <laughs> de-aging them, mm -hmm. you know, going forwards or backwards in time, like a no-save plane shift type effect. Like, yeah, if you're in the Sphinx's lair and it wants to, it's you're on a different plane and there's nothing you can do about it, including getting back home if it wants to strand yeah. you here. So those are pretty, those are potentially game changing campaign altering abilities. And mm -hmm. it, they really, this reason why, like, just if you, if you've got a random encounter table with a Sphinx on it, you roll it up and you go with it. Like you're not doing the monster a disservice. It might run into a snag <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're not ready for it. <laughs> uh, most definitely. Uh, be, because I mean, you look at the Andrew Sphinx's roars and I can yeah. see what, like, how you could use these as maybe a way to test players. Like, oh, if Certainly. you can survive my three roars. But, you know, yeah. technically players would want to fail the second one so that the third one sure, doesn't yeah, affect them. Sure, yeah, take that thunder damage. 
because <laughs> if you can't hear it, it doesn't affect it. And so, yeah. but like, I mean, I can see how it's a progression of, of effects. So anybody who does survive to the third roar, yeah, you might take some damage there. Um, yeah. But even that, that's 44 damage. Like, okay, that's, that's tough. But for, sure. you know, for, for everyone in a 500, 500 foot. feet, yeah, it's the, it's the 500 <laughs> yeah. feet that's uh, yeah. th- uh, that that's the real killer there. <laughs> yeah, so don't and bring it, an army to and that it has thaumaturgy <laughs> and can boost its voice to to match that as well. I, I like that for the Andro Sphinx. It's, it can it, everybody in that 500 foot uh, can hear this uh, giant uh, uh, you know yeah. Sphinx creature. <laughs> But yes, uh, but when you couple it with with all of those insane layer actions, uh, I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. Um, yeah, I, I think like the the layer actions and the tests that it can pose are in, definitely related, as well as like the roar and different spells it could use. Like, remember, the purpose of a sphinx is that it tests a certain quality about those who encounter it, either like their wits and intellect, uh, or their valor and courage and the like, and so. That is like, we should always be asking yourself about a Sphinx when you're preparing to use it because it's going to inform everything. Is there a place on another plane they could take the party to test them? You know, maybe they're looking mm-hmm. to test their courage by taking them to like the howling wastes of pandemonium and seeing how long they can stand it, you know, or the blessed fields of Elysium and seeing if they can resist the temptations that are, uh, you know, that are there and yeah. return to a mortal life. You know, let me show you what heaven's like for a minute. Can't, you know, are, is your determination such that you're going to give this up to finish what you have to do in the, in the mortal realm? You know, those are the kinds of things that you want to use the Sphinx for. And, you know, D&D has been shedding alignment slowly over the years. I think that's ultimately a good thing. But this is one of those places where using alignment as a guideline, not a straitjacket, but a guideline can be very helpful. Uh, especially if you've laid down those foundations earlier in the campaign um, with like how the world responds to PC actions. Um, But you can use the Sphinx as like a way to revisit the character's past accomplishments and endeavors and judge them, you know, not like in a negative sense, but evaluate them. And Mm -hmm. it's a fun way to like reminisce about the campaign and like question the character from the point of view of an NPC. One of the things I love doing in a campaign is like having an NPC ask the character what they think about themselves and their actions. What do you think about what you're doing? The things that you're accomplishing or, or going mm-hmm. through? Like, is this normal to you? How do you deal with it? And like, it can be a really fun social encounter, I think, to like, yeah. how well do the characters know themselves and their own motivations? That might be what the Sphinx is testing, you know? Exactly. Um, and uh, just so you know, if you want to evaluate mine and Jim's uh, past uh, encounters and uh, actions, you can go on over to Patreon, where we have over 200 podcasts uh, just waiting for you to wa- listen to. Uh, so there's there's a lot more WebDM to be had over there. So um, we've kind of set the stage and laid the foundation for what stink- Sphinx does, the Stinks. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, let's let's just give some players some tips here about yeah. um about you know if a if a dm throws a sphinx at you um first off d- don't don't fight it in its lair yeah don't, just try, yeah, just try don't. to fight its lair yeah <laughs> just, just don't <laughs> <laughs> you know other, other other beasties might have a, a tentacle they can throw at you or a, a gust of wind or something from a, a vent or so, a lava chute or whatever right. every round and that's <laughs> tough but you don't want to get thrown 10 years in the future or the past or no. de-aged 1d20 years. So you who was like, no, I want to make an 18-year-old who just <laughs> lost their parents. And now you yeah, got yeah. de-aged 17 years and, you're a, and, and now it's lone wolf and cub with the rest of the party. And they got to raise you again. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 35 is the best age for an adventurer in that sense. You know, <laughs> Just like, yeah. Right in there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If yeah. you're too, if you if you're aged, you'll still be fine. If you're de-aged, you'll still be fine. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now this particular one like looks bad on paper, but recall that fifth edition technically has no rules for what happens when you age, unlike 
other editions of D&D. So this is really DM dependent. It could be nothing or it could be like, I got to make a new character or get the greater mm-hmm. restoration uh, to, uh, to fix it. Like it's more that like the, a lot of the nasty effects of those are like, you don't get a save. Like you don't get a save for it to just drag you to the abyss and leave you there. Yeah. If, if, if it doesn't yeah. want to mess with you and like that one's nasty. The, the, you know, skipping you forward or backwards in time up to 10 years is also really nasty. Cause you could like, depending on how the campaign structured, it's like, well, whatever we were trying to stop, they, they, they got what they wanted. No one else was there. Yeah. We were, you know, we've been shunted forward in time. Um, yeah. We had a year like and a, a day to accomplish humility. this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that could be a way that the Sphinx tests you. How do you handle failure? How do you handle, how do your characters handle knowing that they failed? Like in this mm-hmm. world, they have to live with it. And then they live there for a while. And the Sphinx visits again and goes, all right, it's time to go back. You've learned your lesson. Let's see if, you know, how you deal with the problem now that you know what the consequences of it are. Uh, and yeah. and I think in that sense, it's, it's really, I think for a player considering like, how am I going to kill this thing is like, it's easy. You just hit it really hard, really fast. It doesn't have much else going for it. Use a magic weapon. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, the, on a, on a on a baseline, they have some hit points. They have flight. They can teleport. You know, uh, with their layer act, or excuse me, with their legendary actions. But yeah. like you were pointing out earlier, they don't have legendary resistances. No. So no. <laughs> they just have all the saving throws. Like, you know, if you can get your DCs up high enough with you, say you're a sorcerer and you can do that, or uh, I forgot which which wizard can empower their spells like that or heighten their spells. Um, mm. Uh, you can you can take this thing out if you hit it hard enough and fast enough, um, and can yeah. survive those roars. Depending well, depending on which one you're fighting. Yeah, you know which one? Um, right, yeah, yeah. It's like, but do you but, want to? But, if you're if you're if your DM yeah. has put one of these in, it probably fighting it is not the point. And thinking about no, yeah. different ways is, is uh, to interact with it is the the right call. Yeah, because I would assume, um, especially if a sphinx is sitting in its lair. It's not like it's there to guard. It doesn't. It yeah. doesn't attack. It protects. It does a protect, yeah. not an attack, right? <laughs> and exactly. So yeah. If it's doing a protect, <laughs> and that it can completely cut you off from like what you're looking for, and like in this yeah. sense, the Sphinx can be a little one note, right? Like how many things do you need divinely guarded and the like? Um, but like in just a baseline DMs just cracked it cracked open the monster manual using the baseline lore. If a Sphinx shows up and I'm a player that immediately clues me in of like, I'm not, I'm not supposed to fight this thing. Like a dragon shows up. I'm like, all right, when do we roll initiative? You know, I understand that it's a dragon, but a Sphinx is a type of monster that as a player signals to me, it doesn't matter what its attitude is, whatever, how, you know, I am not supposed to fight this thing. The the metagame challenge here is negotiating whatever test it has. And that's that's what I uh, uh, would focus on. And I think it's also why it's not like a super overpowered monster uh, in terms of its stats. <laughs> totally. And so, yeah. and we kind of touched on some some different ways to use them in campaigns, uh, yeah. but let's 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 kind of elaborate on that because um, I want to go back to one thing uh, you've already mentioned about being shunted forward in time to learn your lesson. But yeah. like DMs, like. Take a note from, uh, you know, in in game and Infinity War, like maybe that's what the Sphinx needs. I'm going to shunt you forward in time so that the bad guy has won and his all of his treasures are centralized. So you can go in and steal the thing that that bad guy used to to come to power. And um, by the way, I'm going to give you a scroll of wish. And once you've done it, you can wish yourself back here. And yeah. now you've taken the thing away, and we can fight them before he gains power. Like, like yeah. have a fun little time travel like adventure. But the thing is, is you can still test everyone in that adventure with the fallout from the bad guy winning, and everyone oh, yeah. that they see would just be like, "Where were you when we needed you? You just disappeared." And it's like, well, uh, you know, yeah. we wouldn't have won anyway. Like now we have a chance. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have the secret weapon. Yeah, yeah. I really like that idea. And then it's it has a nice, like, follow-up consequence of when the inevitables show up. And like, what are you doing throwing around all these time paradoxes? Like, we got that's a huge <laughs> mess you made us clean up. You know? Uh, so it, 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 like, builds on itself as a, as a good unintended consequence to it that I appreciate. But, 
Yeah, that's yeah, phase like, four, though. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and so like, the campaign uses for it are are for me centered very much around its the Sphinx's capacity as a judge, an inquisitor, a guardian. Like, mm -hmm. I've got a Sphinx in the Street of Spells that shows up to resolve like civil disputes. And people can line up and present their case to the Sphinx, and the Sphinx will judge them, so long as the parties agree that whatever the Sphinx decides is binding. And that's like one of the main mechanisms of, of justice within the the, uh, the capital, is these Sphinxes that agree through imperial treaty and divine sanction to, to serve in this capacity. Um, you know, I, others I've had are like a, a Sphinx is a, is what happens when a lion eats a wizard. You know, it's just, it's a consequence of, of <laughs> that's, you know, it's just a regular lion. They ate this wizard and it, and they grow ahead and are, you know, supernaturally wise and, you know, the like, but thinking about it mm -hmm. in, in like interesting ways of, of using those themes with this monster, just like a Sphinx that is is a you know an inquisitive type an investigator someone that like seeks out those to test they don't wait for them to come to them you, you flip the script and maybe they don't have the lair they don't benefit from those but a lot of dms would find that a relief given the consequences of the lair actions and so having a sphinx that seeks out heroes that seeks out notable individuals to test to to like what what can I learn from this uh, mortal and like what can they learn about themselves from my passing you know they could be sent by a god or something for that purpose uh, as well um, other uses are like as a extra planar jailer or prison you know <laughs> just drag the mm -hmm. prisoner to the to the sphinx's lair and off they go to some demi-plane to wait their time you know uh, or, or they're sent back however many years uh, to, to serve uh, in that sense uh, so yeah there's a lot of things you can do when you start thinking about the layer actions uh, and the like. Um, well, what about that yeah. de-aging? The de-aging is ripe for use by some paladin order or mystics of like, why would your glorious hero champion that saved the day however long ago isn't just like living in a monastery with a sphinx that just, when needed, just keeps shaving off 10 years at a time or d20 years at a time or whatever. You know, like it's... It's really, I, I really like that one. <laughs> like an a, eternally youthful paladins that just have lived mm -hmm. for centuries because of this sphinx that supplies them with a fountain of youth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think instead of a fountain, it would just be you go in and you get a kitty bath. And right, it's, it's kind really of a really rough bath. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it sucks. It's it's demeaning, but you come out, man. It's it's exfoliating though. It clears Brian's the pores, it those the wrinkles, wrinkles gives you a little lift. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a little lift. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, come on. What, uh -huh. what more do you what more do you want? The I mean, the the immortal army of the Sphinx is just like, come on, like come like, on. You, yeah, you, why screw, wouldn't you want screw that? You like, uh, yeah, screw you, barbarians that can be resurrected for whatever. I just don't die. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like, a, you know, and, and because the, the, the two sphinxes, and to me, they're interchangeable, right? They're, whether they're, uh, you know, male gendered, female gendered, CR 17, CR 11, those are all things that are negotiable uh, at, at my table. So I see it the same way with, with like a wizardly type sphinx, a gyno sphinx of like, well, this is an order of like, you know, wi holy wizards or something, right? Like they're studying the will of the gods, not from a clerical sense, but from an analytical arcane sense. Or, yeah. screw it, we're going to me mesh these concepts because D&D &D draws this weird line between divine and arcane that is sometimes uh, inconvenient. And yeah, you know, yeah. this is a, a group of holy wizards who have chosen a mon monastic life, but they're they're definitely studying magic. You know, the magic of the stars, the magic of the heavens, that kind of thing. Um, that could easily be another, uh, you know, a mirror situation to the eternally youthful paladins. You know, what's a good wizard to do if they don't want to become a lich, right? Like, how are they going to stick hey, around for ages? <laughs> you get to live forever. I mean, come on, like that's, uh, come on. Oof. Yeah, yeah, that could be really, um, that could be really fun. <laughs> so, um, what are what are uh, if if maybe the the idea of of a, of a cat person doesn't, you know, I don't know, vibe with you, but you like sure. the abilities and the layer actions. How, how would you how would you reskin a sphinx? Uh, mm. 
I think like my the first thing I'm going for is it's like it's just an angel, you know. Uh, the the feline form is just one of its many forms. Maybe it's a lion headed mm-hmm. uh, solar type, you know, like just statuesque and vividly colored, but you know, with a, a fierce lion's head and wings, and just use the same stats and the like. Um, so like, like mythology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, or the like. I like a ram headed sphinx of like lion body eagle wings ram's head you know to me that's Mm -hmm. a very like classical divine creature um same with like a hawk head or a falcon's head uh if you wanted a more like egyptian type uh, uh, feel to it like a a griffin Um, sort yeah something like that yeah um you could also like just go look through other editions of D &D where they've obsessively statted out every variation of (laughs) sphinx (laughs) and (laughs) as sort of like looking for inspiration how to present them in different ways but I, mm-hmm. To me, when I look at the Sphinx, I want to add things to it. I see a discrepancy yeah, between its... Yeah, put it on modify. I'm like, I see a discrepancy between its the lore as presented and what it can do mechanically. And I'm thinking about yeah. adding things like telepathy, making it an actual celestial instead of a monstrosity, um, giving it uh, the ability to like uh, either heart sight from the pixie or divine awareness or both. Uh, which would let it detect lies, uh, as well as have the only alignment perceiving ability in the game. I think that's very appropriate mm-hmm. for a Sphinx to be able to look inside a supplicant's heart and tell yeah, where yeah. they're going to go when they die. <laughs> well, that, or at least just have insight, like as a skill. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, at least. Yeah. It seems that that <laughs> should be there. <laughs> It seems like I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, this is one of those things where there's a tension between like, how big should a stat block be? What does it represent? You know, is it just for combat or is it exhaustive of what the creature can do? And my answer is uh, whatever's convenient for you. Like for me, it's not exhaustive of what a creature can do. Stat block block is a sample of a typical version of a creature and everything about it is up for grabs in terms of what I can change as a DM. Uh, and so, you know, I know that there are players out there who, don't like that and and sort of expect that the game will remain unchanged but to me this is a dm's prerogative to make the kind of monster that they need for their game and if you need your monster Mm -hmm. to have telepathy to be able to detect alignment or tell when someone's lying to them uh without it being a spell right zone of truth can be resisted um like those are the kinds of things that i think are perfectly appropriate especially for a creature like the sphinx where you're you're probably not using it in combat instead using it in some kind of role-playing capacity to impart information or or dispense a reward or to have a non-combat type challenge that the uh the party has to face yeah or you just Could don't want to give beef up, up magic damage command. and give it more attacks <laughs> <laughs> yeah or you make it an earth elemental and have it protect a magic lamp i mean exactly you know. yes <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, all right, folks. Uh, well, this has been a, a fun uh, a fun chat on the Sphinx. There. Hope you learned some things. Uh, hope we didn't test you too much. Uh, but if you, we will test you this way. Could you go ahead and if you're not subscribed, do that. Click the like. Click the bell. It helps with the algorithm, which is the the overlord of us all. Uh, but have a good weekend, gang. We'll see you next week. You're right, I do. It was just a test, Jim. Because we're talking about sphinxes. Oh, I'll wait to you. Oh. Yeah. That was so cute. You're both cute. <laughs> was it work? Did it work? Was it this? I think it worked. What do we need to do again? You're, just, you're both just so cute.